I'm gonna be honest, this review is long overdue. I've been wanting to play this game for what felt like an eternity, but I just had other things come out. But now is the time to finally sit down and enjoy it. And enjoy it, I did. Banjo-Kazooie is a 3D platforming game made by the masters of the N64, Rare. In it, you play as the bear and bird duo Banjo and Kazooie, hence the title. Banjo is lazily sleeping his day away while his sister Tootie is playing outside. The evil witch Gruntilda, or Grunty if you prefer, finds out that her minions don't think that she's the prettiest thing in the world, so she kidnaps Tootie to do a little bit of a switcheroo with her looks. Now it's up to Banjo and Kazooie to get her back, done by tracking through nine worlds and collecting a complete trove of items. You will also meet a lot of allies that will assist you in your journey. The first is Bottles, and he's going to be one of the first characters you're going to want to seek out in each new level. He'll teach you new moves. If you decide to do the tutorial, and yes, it's completely optional, your moves will be limited until you find the dirt mound to summon Bottles. He'll teach the move, and then you'll have to use it in some way. If you did decide to complete the tutorial, you won't be able to enter the true hub world until you find all of Bottles' mounds. If you want to skip the tutorial, you can head right up there. I like this option, and it's a tutorial done right. So let's talk about how the gameplay works. Once you get past the first tutorial stage, whether you partake in it or not, you'll enter Grunny's Lair. From here, you'll need to find a world to enter to find puzzle pieces and musical notes. Puzzle pieces allow you to unlock future stages, and the notes are to open up locked doors in the lair to get to later levels. Just because you find the entrance to the next world doesn't mean you can flat out enter it yet. First, you need to find the portrait of the stage in Grunty's Tower. From there, you need to place the puzzle pieces, known as Jiggies, into the puzzle to complete the portrait. Then, and only then, will the doorway to the stage finally open, and you can enter it properly. Once you get into one of these actual stages, there are two main objectives. Find all 10 Jiggies and all 100 notes. You only truly need 765 notes in order to finish the game, but there are a total of 900 notes available. These notes are found littering the entire stage, and must be found in one run. If you leave the stage, the total you had found are saved as a high score, and if you re-enter the level, you'll need to collect them again. From what I've seen on a wiki, it's because the N64 didn't have the memory required to save each individual note, and considering that you could easily spend an hour in each level, it kind of sucks to have to find all the notes again if you're one note away from completion and die. The Jiggies are a bit more difficult to collect though. Out of the 10 in each level, only a small handful are going to be viewable and in the open. Most of the time, you'll have to complete a task in order to collect the Jiggy. It might be as simple as navigating a maze or completing a puzzle. Other times, there may be a fetch quest style objective, in which you have to collect a certain item and deliver it to an NPC, such as presents to polar bear kids, worms to a baby eagle, and so on. That's where lots of the fun lies, trying to find out how to collect all 10 Jiggies. These pieces are saved in between stage plays, so again, if you die or leave, the Jiggies you've found won't have to be recollected. This is probably good, considering that you'll be spending these Jiggies to unlock further areas. The later stages will need more Jiggies to complete the portraits, so if you do what I did and focus primarily on the easier, earlier stages, later levels won't give you as much frustration since you won't need as many notes or puzzle pieces to move on. Of course, being that this is a rare game, there's going to be a lot more for you to collect. Mumbo tokens can be used to bribe the witch doctor Mumbo into transforming you into different creatures, such as a pumpkin or a termite. This is usually needed to access smaller areas that Banjo can't get into in his normal size. At times, it'll be necessary to exit the stage as this smaller form in order to do something in Grunty's tower, but Mumbo's magic has distance limits, to which he'll warn you that you're getting close to the limits of his power. Keep going, and you'll simply revert back to your normal bear and bird form. Perhaps you see all the other pickups I'm grabbing in this video. Eggs, feathers, stuff like that. In the majority of the stages, you can find bottles to learn some new moves. A lot of the moves require these extra power-ups to function. Red feathers are used to fly around the stages, yellow feathers can be used for invulnerability, and eggs can be shot as a projectile, either spit out in front of you like a bullet or, well, yeah. The C buttons are primarily used in conjunction with Z for these options, but there are sometimes other requirements, such as finding the launch pads to be able to jump into the air to initiate the flying. There are also green pads, 
used to jump higher than normal. One thing to keep in mind is that there are inventory limits, so you can't fly through the stage without consequence. Although the controls are fairly solid, there are a few quirks, and for the most part, they don't deal with camera issues. As I mentioned, your moves are done primarily using the C buttons and Z, but since you have to use the C buttons to fight, that leaves minimal options for camera alterations. Well, you still have R, which is used to recenter the camera behind Banjo's back. So in order to aim your eggs, either you have to aim ahead of time and hope that you're good enough, or slowly jiggle the stick to get Banjo to face in the right direction. Crapping out eggs isn't as difficult. Granted, using the forward-facing eggs aren't used for attacking most of the time, but normally for puzzles, but it can still be frustrating to try and accurately shoot these eggs. The levels themselves are fairly large, with a lot of rooms that you need to enter, NPCs to talk to, and problems to solve. However, not all stages are a blast to play. My least favorite has to got to be Clanker's Cavern, a stage that takes place primarily underwater, and of course Banjo can run out of oxygen if he doesn't grab air. The swimming controls feel a bit loose, and it's hard to accurately steer Banjo to where you need to go. But you also have Gobi's Desert, which is nice and bright, but can be super confusing in what you can stand in and what you can't. The textures don't exactly differentiate themselves enough to be able to play it completely safe. There's also the Mad Monster Mansion stage, which should be a blast since it's the scary level of the game, but at the same time, parts of it are way too dark, making it difficult to see where you're going. Not to mention there's also way too many invulnerable enemies in this stage that can only be taken out by using your golden feathers to become invulnerable yourself. Until I figured that out, I was getting really, really upset at this level. I should mention the final stage of the game that occurs before the final boss battle with Grunty, which, honestly, I've never gotten to. That's because the final stage is a large game show board. In it, you have to answer trivia questions based on facts you've learned about Gruntilda, along with things you've seen in your playthrough. If it's been a while since you've played the game, you may not remember most of these questions. The funny thing is, you'd think there'd be an online guide and it would be easy enough to use, but no. You only have 10 seconds to answer the question, and there are a lot of potential questions, and you cannot pause the game. Plus, allegedly the personal questions Grunty asks about herself have randomized answer, so you have to literally find her sister and probably write down these answers to play it safe. There's also challenge spaces, and although most of them aren't so bad, one of them is the stupid croc one where you have to eat two different colored fruits that rotate sporadically. I hated it in a normal game, but here's a final challenge sort of deal. I couldn't stand it. Fail to answer a question right or fail a challenge, and you'll lose a bit of health. To make things even worse, there are the death spaces, which are still normal trivia, but answer it wrong, and it's an immediate death. That really sucks because if you're almost to the end of the board and mess up that space, it's back to the start with you. I both love and hate this board game quiz show idea. I heard the final battle with Grunty is also painfully difficult, but again, to this day, I've still never reached it. If you can't tell by the footage here, Banjo-Kazooie has some great humor. Banjo is the innocent, friendly voice of the game, whereas Kazooie is the sarcastic one that is always throwing out insults. Bottles has no problem taunting Kazooie back, whereas the other characters may not interact quite as directly with either character. Each one also has their own, shall we say, voice. So as the text is popping up on the screen, you'll hear different noises while it scrolls out, giving it that so-called voice. It's really a neat effect, and sometimes funny just to hold A to speed up the text, as it appropriately increases the pitch of the character as well. Grunty will also randomly spout out some useless quips. And one thing that should be noted is that she always speaks and rhymes. This game just has a certain charm to it that makes me come back to it every few years to attempt to finish it again. But then again, I stop, because when you get to about the Mad Monster Mansion level, the game starts getting stupidly difficult. With the Mansion stage, it's mostly because it's just so damn dark, but the next stage takes place on a boat in oily water that will drain your oxygen even when treading water. The final true stage is Click Clock Wood, which is relatively small, but it takes place in four seasons. The center of it is a massive tree that needs to be climbed, and I can't tell you how many times I've fallen off of it to my death. Sure, if you're good enough, you can time Kazooie to save your life by having her float her feathers in this game's version of a double jump, but it can't be relied on, as it doesn't always work the way it's intended. But by here, I only needed about 25 nodes in order to unlock the final door, so there's that. The game definitely does give you some leeway, as you don't have to find every note or jiggy to complete it but I'm sure there's probably some sort of bonus to give you an incentive to doing so. There's also the famous stop and swap mechanics that were never fully implemented in the N64 carts. 
Basically, there's a few secret items that can be found that were supposed to be used in the sequel, Banjo-Tooie. The stories say that Nintendo wasn't too keen on being able to switch out cartridges while the system was on, for obvious reasons. There's a lot more to the story on the web, such as how the time the game gave you to switch cartridges went from 10 seconds to 1 second to make it impossible, even though I'm sure someone out there will attempt to confirm that it's doable. I just figured this wouldn't be a proper Banjo-Kazooie review without mentioning it. It's a neat idea, and it's a shame it wasn't something that could be utilized in its original form on the N64. I think that's all I got for Banjo-Kazooie. It's one of the first games I ever played on the N64, probably right after Mario 64, and you know what? I think I like Banjo-Kazooie more. Maybe slightly more frustrating at times, but it just has a certain charm. Yes, I know, the game overall plays like a direct clone of Mario 64, with the levels as portraits, finding plot progressing items by completing objectives, and overall 3D platforming mechanics, but who cares? It's still a really fun, solid game, even to this day. One day, I will be picking up the Rare Replay collection for the Xbox One that I have that just collects dust nowadays. And at that point, maybe I'll attempt to stream, because well, let's face it, the N64 controller isn't exactly the most comfortable thing out there. My thumb was killing me after sitting down playing it for a few hours. But overall, if you have an N64, or an Xbox One, this is a worthy game to add to your collection. Maybe one day I should actually open up the copy of Banjo-Tooie I bought about 10 years ago and play it. Eh, one day. Final score? 6 out of 7. This is Reaper. Happy fragging.